What's up guys? Uh, so I'm gonna start by addressing the title of this video, which is um, I'm desperate uh, because I'm pleading, I'm, I'm begging you guys to just please stick with this video until the end. Um, it's, it's a lot of stuff that needs to be said and it's a lot of stuff that needs to be heard. Um, so please, if, if you've ever owed me a favor, I'm calling them in now. Um, my friends, my family, um, specifically the people who, who look like me, uh, we, we, we need the, uh, more awareness, we need to be paying attention. Um, so I'm begging you to please stay with me. I'm, I'm only gonna cover three things. I understand that um, this video has got a little bit of length to it, uh, but please, please stick with it. There's a lot of information and um, yeah. So three things that, that I really wanna talk about uh, are kind of explaining white fragility and how it affects us. Um, addressing systemic racism from a historical standpoint so that we can sort of uh, gain a better understanding for what it actually is and how it started. And um, dispelling some rumors and myths about white privilege in a way that we can, for the purpose of uh, better describing it um, so that we can sort of become aware of it. I'll start with defining what, what white fragility is. And, and the definition of white fragility is the discomfort and defensiveness on the part of a white person when confronted by information about racial inequality or injustice. Uh, now, if you're watching this and we're just at the very beginning and you're thinking, why are you preaching to me? I know what racism is. I know about racism. I know that it happens. That little feeling that you have could be attributed to white fragility um, because white fragility in essence is a deflection tactic uh, for example when somebody's confronted in an argument about black lives matter and their response is well all lives matter uh, we know that all lives matter that's not the point a and, and the fact that you feel the need to say that is a d deflecting from the clear and present danger that uh, surround the black and brown communities especially uh, in, with what's going on now. Uh, another another sort of thing that I've kind of heard, I've been in a lot of conversations, especially over the last 10 days or so, and something that people love to bring up when, for some reason, arguing against Black Lives Matters and police brutality is that, well, what about Black-on-Black -black crime? That is a deflection. Yes, there is Black-on-Black -black crime. Yeah, there is white-on-white -white crime. Yes, and we don't want to talk about it, but there are members of the Catholic Church who sexually assault altar boys. They are all problems, yes, and they all need to be addressed and they all need to be fixed. But the clear and present danger right now is what is what is the police brutality and the targeting towards the black and brown community. That's where our attention needs to be. And to put it elsewhere and make it about something else is deflection. It's white fragility. And the last point I'm gonna make, and this one has a little more tabooness around it because it's already been accepted to say, but um, when it comes to Colin Kaepernick's peaceful protest by taking a knee during the national anthem as a National Football League player, the rhetoric behind it completely got flipped around like that. And instead of it being about what we're protesting about today, it was completely flipped. And white fragility has a huge part to play in that. Um, so how do we kind of combat this uh, sort of reaction to deflect. Well, one, we need to accept the discomfort. We need to accept that it's going to feel weird to talk about. This feels weird for me. I mean, talking into my cell phone about this is not the most comfortable thing, but it's, these are conversations that we need to have with each other. And we need to make it less comfortable to be racist than it is to talk about being racist. Um, Another thing that will help is not giving in to white solidarity. And what I mean by white solidarity, I'll give you an example. If you have an uncle or a grandfather or a cousin or a coworker or a boss who makes a joke that has racist undertones to it, and you know it has racist undertones to it, instead of calling that person out and saying, hey, look, you can't say things like that. Um, if you just kind of like giggle under your breath to kind of avoid there being an issue, um, that would be like white solidarity to actively avoiding the issue so that you can not have to face your white fragility. Um, 
it, it's really important to understand that it's normal to feel this awkwardness and this weird tension. It, it's normal and it's okay. But what's not okay is to um, give in to it. That that can that's unacceptable. Um, we, that's why I say we need to have these conversations and you need to uh, accept the, the discomfort. Understand that uh, as, as, a, as the white community, like we don't know what we don't know. And, and that's okay, like it, it, it's not your fault that we don't know. The education system does not teach us enough about black history. So if we don't go out and look ourselves, we're not going to know. Um, but understand that changing your viewpoints after you've educated yourself is not hypocrisy but growth for example if you're one of those people who says there's no such thing as white privilege and all lives do matter it is okay to switch that viewpoint after becoming educated that is that's what we need and we need to continue to do that uh, on a large scale um now where does this this white fragility where does it come from uh, it stems from benefiting from a system that oppresses others. So think of it like a scale. When we're oppressing the, the minority communities, by definition, it's making our lives easier. And it's okay to feel bad about that. That's where that white fragility comes from. And that scale, that, that system uh, that oppresses others is, is what's referred to as systemic racism. Um, now, in order to understand racism, we need to understand history. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment states, Neither slavery nor involuntary solitude, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Now you might be saying, what does this have to do with systemic racism? The 13th Amendment is a great thing, right? And it is. It's what ended slavery. It was ratified in 1865 and it effectively ended slavery in the United States. But... There's a massive loophole built into this amendment. Um, if, if we look at it again, like, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to its jurisdiction. That is a massive loophole in, in the rhetoric there and the, the verbiage and the way that that's worded. What that's saying is there will be no slavery unless you commit a crime. There'll be no slavery unless you're a criminal. There will be no slavery uh, unless you're a felon. And, and I'll tie in how that's important in just a second. Let's look at something that I call the flow of oppression or the flow of systemic racism. It starts at the beginning of America with slavery. And that started you know, in the 1400s all the way up until 1865. And then we fall into this Jim Crow era from 1865 to the 1960s, almost 100 years after slavery has been abolished. And then the last piece is this mass incarceration, which started in the 1960s, and is something that we deal with even today. Um, now I'm going to go into these a, a little bit more detailed because it, it's necessary to understand how it's sort of bounced um, from from spot to spot. We'll start with slavery, and we can all agree slavery is bad; should never have happened. I would venture a guess to say that 99% of people would agree. That should never happen and we should never have even been in that situation to begin with but we cannot just gloss over it because of that we need to understand that people were taken from their homes from their families from their land and brought here forced here in chains to build our country for free and then to be treated like property um, a very very dark time and I don't think it gets it gets said enough in our education system about how devastating uh, that is for an entire people. Um, but we get to 1865, we get the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and slavery's done, right? That's the end of racism, right? No. So these Jim Crow laws get passed, and, and you look, look them up and see how ridiculous they are, but all these different things that are just set up to uh, marginalize this community that has just been freed from slavery. And that's the beginning of sort of the, where the loophole except as punishment for crime in the 13th Amendment, where that's kind of starts to 
show up and realize like, hey, this is actually just a cycle where, okay, you're a slave and then we'll find you guilty of a crime that we made up and then you're a slave again. That was kind of the way of life from, like we said, the 1865 until about 1954. That's almost 100 years later when Brown versus the Board of Education. And I'm sure you've heard the term Brown versus the Board before, but basically what that created was this the thought process of you, you, black people and white people are equal, but it's totally legal for us to keep them separate. So that separate but equal um, sort of mindset was allowed w with Brown versus the board. And that goes for 10 years until uh, 1964. And that's when you have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which effectively ends segregation in public places. How does that become mass incarceration? Well, so where are we now? We're at 1964. From 1964 to 1968 is this, like this huge civil rights movement. And it goes, there's civil rights movement started way before that and lasted way after that. But the point I'm stopping at 1968 is that's when Richard Nixon ran for president as a law and order candidate. Um, so it, in the late 60s, there's this, there's this uh, crime rate. It boosts way up and people, the question is why? Why is crime so bad? Uh, why are crime rates so high right now? And the answer that was given from politicians was it was those damn civil rights activists, those black people are monsters and they're creating all this crime. And so Nixon had this plan to sort of destroy the people who opposed him. His opposition were the, the anti-war liberals and black people. I'm gonna pull up a quote here from a man named John Ehrlichman, who John Ehrlichman, when he was, he was the uh, chief of domestic policy under Nixon. And this is a quote that he gave to a reporter of Harper Magazine. Uh, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know that we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Using that sort of strategy, Nixon runs this campaign for a war on drugs and a war on crime. And it's a rhetoric that further marginalizes the black and brown community by design. As you can see, like that was the, the strategy, that was the plan. Um, and that's obviously awful. But it gets worse because in the 1980s, Reagan kind of turns it up. He turns this rhetorical war on drugs and war on crime into a literal one. He once bragged in an interview that uh, he would triple drug law enforcement spending in his first term, and he did. Listen to what Lee Atwater had to say. Now, Lee Atwater was a, a, a campaign strategist and a, a political strategist for not only Reagan, but George H.W. Bush, so presidents through the 80s, in the beginning of the 90s, and here's what he had to say. In other words, you start out, and yeah, now y'all aren't quoting me on this. All right, I won't hear it. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger, that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, forced busing, states rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. So if you take that and you add in the crack cocaine debacle, but essentially uh, the prison time for one ounce of crack cocaine was equal to the prison sentence of 100 ounces of powder cocaine. And I'm just gonna pose you with this question, which communities do you think were affected the most by crack cocaine? And which communities do you think were affected most by powder cocaine? Look it up, you won't be surprised at what you find. So with this war on crime and this war on drugs, America further marginalized the black and brown communities uh, with a system that disproportionately targets those communities by design. Like, I mean, the proof is right there. It was designed to be that way. Uh, so, that kind of brings in the question, where does police brutality fall into this whole thing? When did police brutality start? And that's the problem that we're dealing with today, or at least one of the reasons that we have these protests is because of police brutality. So where did that start? And the answer is at the very beginning. 
So let's go back to the very beginning, that first system of oppression, slavery. This police system in America was based around catching runaway slaves. So then you move to this uh, Jim Crow era and they were Jim Crow law enforcers. Okay, then you move to civil rights and there were civil rights agitators. And what I mean by that is, and this is a fact, again, look it up. Martin Luther King, Fred Hampton Jr. and Angela Davis were all at one point or another on the FBI's most wanted, most dangerous list. Some of the most intelligent, uh, wise and well-spoken people in the 60s, not black people in the 60s, but people in the 60s, uh, were vilified by a federal agency like that um, because they were that afraid of losing their, their white supremacy, their hold on this nation. Um, but to move forward with the police thing, the police are also the point of contact with the black and brown community in this mass incarceration system that we have today. So all of that to say that there has never been a time in United States history where the police haven't targeted black and brown communities. Now I know that's kind of like a weird way to put that, but essentially what I said was, and it's true, the police have always targeted those communities. And whether that be by primary design or secondary consequence, doesn't matter. It still holds true that the target has always been on the black and brown community. So the next time that you get pulled over by a cop and you're thinking to yourself, oh man, please just give me a warning. That fear you have of getting a ticket is nothing compared to the fear that a black and brown person may have that they're going to lose their life because historically it has happened enough times that that's a realistic fear to have. And what that is called is white privilege. We have the privilege of not having to worry if the cop's going to kill us because we have a broken taillight or because we jaywalked or anything like that. That is white privilege. And before I get further into what white privilege is, let's, let's talk about what it's not. White privilege uh, does not mean your life is going to be easy because you're white. We all agree that that sounds ridiculous. Ridiculous. That sounds ridiculous. Nobody thinks that. There are problems that black and white people share. For example, there are black and white people who experience poverty. There are black and white people who will never get the health care that they need and deserve because of insurance and it's too expensive. Uh, classism, meaning, uh, for example, the, the justice system treats you better if you are rich and guilty than if you are poor and innocent. Look up the Khalif Browder story. Uh, with the, the bail laws that we have today, classism is another big issue we face here in America, um, especially for black and brown communities. Um, so then what is white privilege? White privilege is your life will most likely not be harder because you are white for the sole reason of you being white. Uh, society will most likely treat you better because you are white. For example, cops will generally be nicer to you. You'll get better uh, health care from doctors or at least better bedside manner, that's for sure. Um, you go to a bar or a restaurant, the wait staff will treat you very different if you're white than if you're black. And uh, that's not even debatable. I've worked in restaurants for the last 11 years. I've seen it and I'm ashamed to say I've been a part of it. I'm guilty of that too. We all are. It, it doesn't mean that your life will be easy. So when people say they disagree that white privilege is a thing because they grew up poor or because they had to join the military uh, in order to, to provide, that's not what white privilege is at all. Um, um, bear in mind that as white people, when it becomes too much and we need a mental health break from the craziness of the world right now and these protests and the racism, we can log off of Facebook and Twitter, we can close our computer, we can, we can lock our phone and completely disconnect from it. That's a privilege, um, which kind of brings me to my last point on white privilege and my overarching example of what white privilege is, is that uh, we learn what racism is through research, through watching documentaries or watching the media or, or doing our own research on Google. And that is a privilege because uh, as a member of the minority community, Racism is learned through experience, from seeing it, from living it, from, from being affected by it. That is white privilege. We will never understand the challenge of being black 
in America. We just won't. We will not be able to empathize because we will never feel anything like it. It is our job to use this privilege that we have to move forward and to eradicate white supremacy. So now you have some info, right? Now what? The answer is not an easy one because there is no one size fits all solution to this problem. It, you kind of have to ride the wave, meaning you need to keep an open mind. You need to be open to criticism from your friends and family that are it, it, that are part of a minority community, whether it be black or brown or Latino or, or Asian American or, or whatever it is. You need to be able to listen and take advice. Um, you need to have the awkward conversations that make you uncomfortable. We need to do this as a people in order to, to face this problem. Um, this is not a black versus white issue. This is a humanity versus racism issue. And if you take that stance and you truly believe that, that whole white fragility aspect is a lot easier to kind of work through. Um, as evidenced by the, the flow of oppression that I talked about earlier, how we went from slavery to where we are today, systems of oppression in America are historically incredibly durable. So we need as many voices and as many um, allies as possible to sort of raise awareness to this that this happens and to shut down uh, these systems of oppression that are built for the for the purpose of uh, maintaining our white supremacy <sighs> understand that this may seem like a moment in history but it needs to be approached like a movement in history. This cannot be a two week thing. It, this has to be an eternal, every day making a choice to be better as a, as a white person, to help, to any way you can. You need to use your voice. Uh, the term is, has been, you know, white silence is white violence. Uh, it's no longer enough to not be racist. Just because you're not the one screaming the the, the discriminatory words or or having these mindsets it's not enough anymore it is not enough to not be racist you need to be an active anti-racist every day every day because that makes you a part of the solution and if you're not a part of the solution you're a part of the problem to all my my friends who have stuck with me and family who have watched this whole thing um thank you and, and i hope that this information moves you the same way that it moves me um, to all my friends who and family who, who look like me this is our fight too we need to be better we need to do better we need to hold each other to a higher standard um, to all my friends and family who don't look like me i'm sorry i'm sorry that it's taken this long for the world to kind of understand and on a personally uh, I'm sorry that's taken me to fully grasp exactly what happened, what happens, and what's happening. Uh, I've considered myself an ally for as long as I can remember because I thought I know I know enough about racism and black history. Um, but to know enough is to know nothing. Uh, we need to continuously be educating ourselves and learning and growing. I'm gonna call in one more favor, and that's please watch the documentary 13th. It's a documentary on Netflix. Um, it's incredibly informative, it, 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 transformative, enlightening. Um, it's where I got most of this information. They go in much more detail, and they have experts and activists who, who are <laughs> more well-spoken than I am. Um, so definitely go and watch that. And I, I'm gonna close out with a clip from that documentary because I just can't think of a better way to to, to end this. People say all the time, well, I don't understand how people could have tolerated slavery. How could they have uh, made peace with that? 
How could people have gone to a lynching and participated in that? How did people uh, make sense of this segregation, this uh, white and colored only drinking? That's so crazy. I just, if I was living at that time, I would have never tolerated anything like that. And the truth is we are living at this time and we are tolerating it.